The Cuban Missile Crisis from the Cuban Perspective video, The Armchair Historian. I haven't watched this yet, so I don't know what's going to happen. So we'll see. It is so just dramatic. after midnight in the Bay of Pigs. A lone Cuban soldier crouches behind a rock. The bodies of his patrol mates are strewn around him, their position lit up by the burning jeep they arrived in. All he can do is pray their last desperate radio transmission gets through, and that news of the imperialist invasion reaches headquarters in time. I mean, they knew that it was coming, so um, this isn't true. Like, they knew where the main invasion was coming from. A shadowed Before figure leans into view, and the militiamen sees his chance for revenge. Yep, okay. The horrible revelation strikes harder than any bullet. That was no imperialist dog. Instead, the shocked face was that of his own countrymen. What? The thoughts of both Cuban-born soldiers fill with regret. As oh, they no. lie, they ultimately accomplished nothing, nothing but driving Cuba right into the arms of the Soviet Union. Who had swept Ooh. to power three years earlier in a popular revolution against the US backed dictator Fulgencio Batista. Although supposedly planned in absolute secrecy, the operation had been compromised almost from the beginning by Cuban and Soviet intelligence. So, see, the operation had been compromised from the very beginning, but in the intro, they said, like, oh, they had no idea. Despite its abject contradict themselves in the first two minutes failure, the invasion was neither the first time America had tried to interfere in Cuba, nor would it be the last. A state of affairs that would lead the world to the brink of nuclear annihilation in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, if only. In this video, we will examine the often studied crisis from the perspective of the Cuban people, both the pro-Castro and anti-communist factions. Oh, see? So that's how they get you, right? It's from the Cuban perspective, but also they're going to examine it from what is effectively the American perspective, like the Cuban-American perspective that just so happens to agree with the US government on everything. That's how, that, you know, that's how they, they technically get to name it from a Cuban perspective and then just present you with the bog standard US narrative. Who in modern study are cast as background characters in their own story in Latin America, which arose in response to the blatantly exploitative practices of US big businesses. Ew. Backed by the world's largest capitalist economy, international corporations monopolized trade in lucrative local produce and used their immense profits to dominate local elections and install corrupt officials who- I mean, this is very reductive, but I mean, right now, they're, they're just telling you like, like the tanky. The tanky narrative right now. This is it. Turned a blind eye to their shameless pillaging. Like, the, the reason why I say it's reductive is because I don't like how they frame, it's often framed like, like, you know, the, the, the local bourgeoisie didn't, had nothing to do with this. Because it, it's, it's pretty much the reason why these companies can even get a foothold in Latin America in the first place is because it was beneficial for the local, local, especially agricultural bourgeoisie. It was the era of neocolonialism, with many Latin American- It still is the era of neocolonialism, but I mean, so far this isn't so bad. It's taking like a, ver a very sort of reductive, like, like this is like, this is like the thing that like a 14 year old, um, a 14 year old with ML and, and supports North Korea in his bio, this is how like he would narrate this to you. So I mean, so far it's, it's not what you would expect from this channel countries being run as imperialist outposts while maintaining the veneer of sovereignty and economic development. Whenever this stranglehold on the continent was threatened, the United States shed any pretenses of upholding democracy and resorted to sabotage. This hypocrisy was on full display in 1954 when the CIA overthrew the legitimately elected president of Guatemala Ooh. in favor for an anti-communist military junta. It is no wonder then that the first signs of American interference in Cuban affairs began as soon as Fidel Castro revealed his intentions to dismantle their monopoly on his nation's vast sugar plant. Okay, there's um, they might go into it right after this, and I'll look like an idiot, but they they miss they're leaving out a lot. Like the U.S. domination over Cuba began literally immediately after it it left the Spanish Empire after or literally during the fucking. It's, it's war with the Spanish Empire for independence, right? Because the US basically leveraged the assistance that it gave to Cuba. Like, you know, the US invented 
invented a justification to enter the war by effectively sabotaging their own ship. And then um, they, they intervened on the side of the, of the Cuban independence fighters, but with the caveat that, you know, they, they were doing it sort of uninvited. They sort of inserted themselves into the war and they were doing it because they wanted you know, to gain influence over Cuba. And then after the war, when, when Cuba drafted its constitution, they, they enforced like a bunch of um, very coercive stipulations into it that effectively made it, um, made Cuba a colony of the USA. Like, like it gave the USA like the explicit right to invade Cuba, for example, if it didn't like anything that was happening there. This is also the origin of the US lead song Guantanamo Bay. It's, it's incredibly reductive, these videos. It's like 23 minutes. You would expect them to go far more in depth, but I guess they, they spend all their budget on the animation, so they don't have anything left for, for critical thought. It's, re it's reductive, but it's not particularly wrong in any sort of huge way so far. Plantations. Some Cubans in the direst straits saw this as a chance to finally seize the means of production away from the faceless overseas corporations that had dominated their lives for decades. Expectedly, the U.S. reacted with aggressive sanctions, and the revolutionaries lacked enough experience to maintain the economy while simultaneously supporting Castro's many new social welfare programs aimed at uplifting the rural poor. But this progress was dearly bought. Right, spit on. It's like they, they somehow managed to blame Cuba for problems, but the thing is, like, they, they just, like, invented, like, they said, like, there was economic problems or something caused by Castro, etc. But actually, like, the first 20, 30 years of the revolution, well, not the first 30 so much, but, like, the first 20, 25 or so, were incredibly successful economically. Incredibly successful. Like, by the 70s, it was... Basically, Cuba was like an example for everyone else. At least it was considered that way. Whatever they were doing, it, it certainly worked pretty well. And like, they, they, they weren't really improving social programs per se. This period was mostly built around sort of like changing, completely upending the produ how production was done. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't, there weren't really people who were being subsidized too much for unemployment, though there certainly were some. It was more like, you know, there was land reform, people were given a more direct relation to to their land, especially in, in agrarian areas. Factory workers were, you know, had like a much better work-life balance, overall like um, more access to goods than they did before, stuff like that, more so than social program simply fixing everything. I mean, it's reductive in every single way so far. I, I mean, I can't really complain when so far it's mostly been reductive in favor of my point of view, so it's good so far. And Castro sought to protect his nascent workers' utopia at all costs. From the start, he made it very clear that the resources and social programs of his new government were exclusively available to fellow revolutionaries. Castro was not, like, a communist from the beginning. It's just, it's very reductive. He was essentially like a, like a nationalist sort of, um, economic nationalist, I suppose. Like someone who just wanted Cuban economic sovereignty. And, th and that also meant that he was against, like, the elements of the bourgeoisie that were collaborating with foreign powers. Essentially, he was more of an economic nationalist for the first year or two, and during the revolution as well. Che was the one who was more of a communist from the very beginning. Those Cuban citizens who did not openly embrace socialism were ostracized at best, and permanently re-educated at worst. That second part is not true. And the fact of the matter is that the government was incredibly popular, incredibly popular, like 80-90% approval ratings in the first like 10 years or so. So most of the people who left, you know, they didn't leave because they had like mild criticism of the government and they were ostracized. They left because they were, they were rich generally and their farms had been stolen and their slaves were taken away. You know, that's, people usually say that in sort of like a joking way, but a lot of, in many, in many respects, it's extremely true. The people who left in the in the early years like the first 10 years were pretty much overwhelmingly from very privileged backgrounds and they were very mad that they that their privileged backgrounds were being taken away and now they were sort of on being put on the same level as um, everyone else. For those who dared betray their Cuban heritage and openly side with the Americans, immediate exile was the best they could hope for. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're siding with like a country that's literally like essentially in an open war with you because they declared what is basically a blockade on your country, right? Then yeah, I would expect you to have to leave because you're essentially committing treason. I'm pretty sure, you know, if the US was at war with another country, in the same circumstance, this exact same thing would happen. You you would be fucking arrested if you stayed in the US, right? It happened during World War II, like, people who supported the Germans were arrested. Like, Japanese people were put into fucking concentration camps just for being Japanese. 
without any evidence. So obviously painting this as something, some sort of incredible level of like undue oppression that isn't expected essentially from nation states in general is obviously sus. What divided these two camps was not a matter of national pride, but of politics. Just about- I'm pretty sure if you side with a country that wants to dominate your country explicitly, like the USA was dominating Cuba for the past 50 years earlier, it was in their fucking constitution that they essentially had the right to dominate Cuba and you treat it like a colony. I'm pretty sure that you cannot say that those people are not loyal like nationalistically to their country, right? I'm pretty sure it's fair to say that. And they're probably more interested in fucking making money for themselves, right? That's not controversial, but they're framing it like they're victims. Cubans were patriots tired of witnessing their island's exploitation. Oh, so all of them were patriots, even the ones who went and joined, like the rich kids who went and joined with the USA. They were all patriots, apparently. You know, go to the USA because because your kind of, because your your millions of dollars in assets were taken away and you couldn't underpay your workers anymore. Time to go to the USA, but you're somehow a patriot. You somehow care about the development of your country and its people more than just your own economic interests. Obviously not, right? Come on. But what divided them was Castro's agenda. No, Resistance movements soon sprang up, but without a powerful backer, there was little they could accomplish. The resistance movements that sprang up were essentially holdouts of the dictatorship. They were very small and they were US supported clandestinely and from Miami, etc. There's always going to be remnants to get after su such a massive political upheaval. That's when the CIA approached members of the Cuban Democratic Revolutionary Front, <laughs> offering Democratic. to transport 1,400 men across the Caribbean Sea and onto the island, where they would proceed to liberate the nation from Castro's regime. However, this endeavor was doomed from the start, and the men who participated in it ultimately accomplished nothing besides convincing their socialist brothers and sisters that the U.S. was utterly and completely dedicated to the destruction of their new workers' republic. The invasion to topple their communist regime only succeeded in making Cuba more communist. Basically true. On December 2nd, Castro pledged fealty to the Soviet Union in a televised address, declaring, I am a Marxist Leninist and shall be one until the end of my life. He went on Based. to state that Soviet style communism would be the guiding force in Cuban politics, replacing the more generalized set of socialist ideals his regime had previously adhered to. To the Cuban exiles living abroad in Florida and Mexico, this was the worst case scenario, reducing the nation they loved to little more than a pawn in the struggle between the Soviets. Oh please, they wanted to be a pawn of the USA. Like they're painting this as if that like the other side is like a, some sort of like pure pure nationalists rather than rather than like the the elements of the bourgeoisie who had to leave because uh, essentially because of ch the change changes in relations of economic production which didn't benefit them please they weren't nationalists they they, they would love to side with the fucking us that's why they've done it for the past 40 50 years so this is the problem with him painting it initially like like it was just us us companies dominating etc cetera, etc cetera, and, and he sort of left out the bits about um the, the locals who were very happy with that arrangement, who enabled it. So that, that sort of a mission enables whoever wrote this to sort of um, paint it as like a battle between, you know, communist nationalists and so-called like normal nationalists who just love their country and want it to be non-aligned, which was not at all the case. That's why they allied with the fucking CIA, right? Like, how does he possibly reconcile like painting them as like neutral nationalists, like non-aligned nationalists who just don't want their country to be used as a, as a pawn with them literally moving to Miami and collaborating with the CIA to invade Cuba? It makes no sense, right? If I was writing this script, I would have realized that in two seconds and been like, wow, this makes no sense. I better delete all of it. You know, you can't expect a good script from a channel with 1.2 million subscribers. It's too much to ask, right? And the Americans. However, things were not quite as clear-cut as they seemed. Following his passionate endorsement of communism, Castro was confused by a lukewarm and non-committal Soviet reaction. He had inadvertently placed the USSR and first secretary Nikita Khrushchev in a particularly awkward position, as Cuba could not receive Soviet military aid without sparking an American response. But even with- I mean, that's not really true. Cuba could have easily received, like, normal weapons and stuff. The US wouldn't have attacked them just for that. Especially after the Bay of Pigs failed. Uh, after the failure of the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy was incredibly pissed. I mean, Kennedy was- obviously he's guilty for a lot of what happened, but he, he was more conciliatory than basically everyone around him. 
without Soviet support, Castro did his best to prove his worth in the eyes of his new Marxist-Leninist peers, going so far as to send his own 13-year-old son, Fidelito, to a school in Moscow. Like, going to schools in the USSR was very normal. It, it was like the communist country equivalent of, like, sending your kids to Stanford. The universities there were just better. But it was not until early 1962 that Castro was validated by the Soviets. Suddenly, Soviet newspapers began publishing articles praising his regime as a model of Marxist-Leninist efficiency. Shortly afterwards, Castro received word that Khrushchev was sending two senior members of his government, Marshal Sergei Birusov and Party Secretary Sharaf Rashidov, to speak with him about securing Cuba's future. See, they're trying to paint it as if Cuba became like a puppet state of the USSR. Obviously, just look, look at the fucking image. It's incredibly obvious what they're trying to do, right? So the USA were the good guys because Cuba was controlled by the USSR, who we all know are evil. At this historic meeting, an astonished Castro listened as the two men carefully laid out Khrushchev's plan to station no less than 40 nuclear-tipped ballistic cruise missiles on the island, defended by a large Soviet garrison and numerous anti-aircraft batteries. Armed with such weapons, Cuba would be nothing less than an impregnable fortress, able to threaten nuclear Armageddon on any pertinent foe who dared challenge its sovereign. I mean, they're framing this very um, ominously, but the fact of the matter is Cuba had just been invaded by the USA as they went over, though they tried to frame it as an independent initiative of Cuban soldiers, which was not at all the case. A lot of people in the US government wanted, wanted the US military to be involved, but Kennedy sort of vetoed it because he didn't want he didn't want that sort of escalation but it was a US oper operation in all intents and purposes cuba having like a preventive stockpile a, pre a stockpile of um nuclear weapons to prevent a US invasion is hardly some terrible unimaginable thing it's hardly like oh incredibly morally wrong especially since the US 90 fucking miles away had infinitely more and obviously had been an aggressor against it it's completely logical what they want to do. It makes perfect sense. Any country that is at risk of being invaded by another country in such an obvious way, you cannot blame them if they want a deterrent against that, especially such a tiny country against literally the world's most powerful superpower. Remarkably, Castro did not instantly accept this proposal, make this realizing awesome. that the Soviets were not making it purely out of the kind kindness of their hearts. His nation would not have direct ownership or even access to these new missiles, and Castro worried that the U.S. might launch a preemptive attack if they were discovered prior to installation. Even the promise of additional equipment for the Cuban army and the knowledge that he was acting in the cause of international socialism was not enough to fully overcome Castro's miss. Why does he like international socialism? Like he tries to make it out like they're a cult or something. Come on. Misgivings. But in the end, he convinced himself that it would be morally wrong not to accept the deal, as he had already put great pressure on the USSR to defend his revolution, while having little practical value to offer in return. Therefore, with some reluctance, Castro agreed to the Soviet plan. Between July and August of 1962, various high-profile members of the Cuban government traveled to Moscow to negotiate the details of the Soviet military installation. These included Fidel's brother, Raul Castro, and his close comrade, Ernesto Che Guevara. The Soviets threw lavish parties for both the dignitaries and arranged tours. See, they're like trying to make it out like they were bribed into this or something. Like, do you think, like, oh, you know, see, these people are not rational actors, right? When they went to the USSR, they were treated well. So clearly, they agreed to this out of some sort of coercion or, you know, out of being bribed or something. It's so fucking dishonest. Like, like they treat normal diplomacy as if it's some sort of, like, shady thing because it happens to be with the USSR. ...of various secret military facilities. While Raul came back full of praise for their new allies, Che was more reserved, suspicious of the way Khrushchev seemed to downplay the threat posed by the USA during their personal meetings. During the negotiations, both sides drafted multiple agreements, finally settling on terms that would see over 40,000 Soviet boots on the ground in Cuba, in addition to the missiles. Construction of the missile sites needed to take place under absolute secrecy, but Castro was confident his state security apparatus would be more than up to the task. However, his regime was still facing numerous threats, both foreign and domestic, that made- Yeah, and how is this from the Cuban perspective, right? Like, I'm telling you right now, I guarantee you that the Wikipedia article on this subject is significantly more in-depth than this video is. And apparently this is Cu Cuban Missile Crisis from the Cuban perspective. I guarantee you that the Wikipedia article on this subject is probably five times more in-depth than this video. It's like, it's a, this, this video is, is not even a skim of that article. It's terrible. 
in terms of the details and everything. It's just, it's like, like, honestly, this is like a simple English Wikipedia article, but with pretty graphics. Like as someone who tries my hardest to go into like exhaustive detail in all of my videos, like in my, in my next video, I have like a five minute fucking segment where I go over s s fucking random quality of life statistics about a country. Cause, cause I felt like it was needed to prove my point. But someone like this would just say, quality of life was bad with nothing with not with like no proof whatsoever and like a graphic showing like some guy like living in his own shit and that would be enough like why do i why do i bother why don't i just like say whatever the fuck i want without backing it up like these people do honestly i need to do this i need to stop crying i need to stop caring about proving my points because it doesn't no one cares it keeping his promises to the soviets much more difficult than initially anticipated for starters, the Cuban economy had continued to sharply- Yeah, this is more like, this is more like Cuban Missile Crisis from the perspective of, of a US Democrat Party voter. It's not, it's nothing to do with Cuba. ...decline thanks to a mixture of incompetent administration and US sanctions, leading to food riots in several cities. The CIA had also food initiated riots. Operation Mongoose in 1961, which had the goal of inciting a civil revolt in Cuba within a year. The program included everything from assassination attempts on Castro to terrorist attacks carried out on Cuban infrastructure. Indeed, the CIA would plot to assassinate Castro so many times in such absurd variety of ways, such as with exploding seashells, poisoned milkshakes, and fungus-infected wetsuits, that he famously stated, if surviving assassination attempts were an Olympic event, I would win the gold medal. There was also an ongoing insurgency movement known as the S. Cambrai Rebellion, made up of former Batista loyalists and Cubans who opposed Castro's socialist government. These bandidos managed to make such a nuisance of themselves that Soviet assessors rejected Cuba's thick inner jungles as potential locations for their new missile site. Not really true. By this point, they were, they were pretty much almost wiped out and they were just doing like very isolated terrorist attacks. It's partially because they provided the perfect cover for guerrilla operations. The sites were instead placed in more open locations, leaving them vulnerable to discovery. Despite the regime's efforts, the Cuban public soon became aware of an increased Soviet presence in their homeland. Soon, a constant game of cat and mouse was being played between Castro's security forces and the alleged CIA informants. Like, I mean, it wasn't really a secret that there were Soviet troops in Cuba. The secret was that they were helping to build these missile complexes and install the missiles and stuff. Security was paramount, as only Castro and his closest associates were supposed to know the full details of the plan, and anyone who caught wind of the details outside that closed circle had to be silenced. Of course, Cuba's little secret was never going to stay hidden for long. The U.S. had been flying U-2 spy planes over the island since its failed invasion. And on October 14th, a U-2 flight successfully photographed yeah, like the, way the missile that this site is, at San Cristobal. Like, the way that this is framed, it's like they're going over how, like, the CIA is funding terrorist attacks in Cuba. How, how, how the USA for, essentially forced Cuba to, to get, get very close with the USSR for its own protection, etc, etc. All of this stuff. Yet somehow they're framing it like every single thing that Cuba does is like really ominous, really underhanded, really evil, right? Like this is from the Cuban perspective and then you watch it and it's like, this is like an American who, who is somehow trying to find a way to frame Cuba as, as the, the big bad here when it's a tiny country, which at the time had about 6 million people in it, which was essentially forced to align itself with one great power over another because that the other great power simply wasn't invading it and sanctioning it and stuff, okay? Like, come on. There's clearly one side here that is in the wrong and one side that wasn't. Eight days later, President John F. Kennedy made a televised 18-minute speech in which he revealed to the world the unmistakable evidence of missile bases in Cuba and announced a blockade that would not only prevent further shipments of Soviet arms and personnel, but any shipping from reaching the island. The Cuban Missile Crisis had officially begun. I mean, the, the the blockade was already incredibly extensive before that. Before that, it was like sanctions. This was like an actual blockade. At least, that was as far as the rest of the world was concerned. Within Cuba itself, almost all mention of international events was suppressed, save for the narrative maintained by the state. But this was not enough to keep the populace from realizing the danger posed by the missiles, and people began to stream in from the countryside to be with their families. In the close-knit society of Cuba, preparations for nuclear war took second place to simply being together with loved ones if the worst came to the worst. This is honestly just something that he's making up. It's something that like, an American would project. 
Even so, only a few senior officials within the government fully understood the gravity of the situation, and fewer still were able to shed the blinders of ideology and accept the utter devastation that a nuclear war. Yeah, like it's it's all it's all Cuba's fault, right? It's all it's all Cuba's fault. Somehow it's it's not the fault of the USA for you know wanting to wanting to invade Cuba, forcing them towards the USA, forcing them to get all of these um, preventative measures against the US invasion. Somehow it's it's somehow it's it's Cuba's fault because they had the ideological blinders on. Those fucking idiot Cubans, don't they know that they shouldn't defend themselves? Why don't they just let themselves be invaded by the US? Why don't they just let themselves be genocided? Why don't they just let them why don't they just let the USA reinstall all of the US companies that 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 they mentioned themselves dominated Latin America before this? Like come on, man. There's there's the cognitive dissidence ne necessary to like say the things that he's saying, yet still frame Cuba as the supposed bad guy. Just absurd. It's, it's, oh, it's nonsensical. What a joke. Would cause. But men like Fidel Castro and Che Guevara had built their reputation by being both steadfast and uncompromising, and neither intended to back down in the face of American threats. To I mean, they didn't intend to back down, because backing down meant being essentially being defenseless against the US. You know, they wanted to get something out of this. They, they, they wanted to make sure that the US wouldn't, inv wouldn't invade them, that Cuba would at least get something out of, like, you know, this conflict between two great powers. Yeah, oh, no, they're just steadfast idiots, right? They're, they're not rational beings, you know. You can't expect some native, someone who doesn't speak English as, as a native language to ha have, like, a brain, right? They're just completely motivated by, by stubbornness. To Che Guevara especially, this was nothing less than the final struggle between capitalism and communism. <laughs> and nuclear war was completely acceptable, if not preferable, to achieve the extinction of the former and the triumph of the latter. By the way, the, the quotes attributed to Che in regards to that, most of them are false. There is a single interview, one single interview after the fact, where where, where he said that um you know you know he, he would have preferred launching the nukes to, to just surrendering to the U.S. But you know they don't need to cite sources in this. They don't need to tell you where this shit is coming from. They just get some fancy animations, read the Wikipedia article, r repeat one tenth of what it says. Immediately after Kennedy's declaration, Castro took to the podium, issuing a stinging rebuttal that outlined America's long history of aggression and state-sponsored terrorism against his beloved nation. Yeah, and when it, it was came all time true. to address the issue of Soviet missiles, Castro had this to say. What have we done? We have defended ourselves, that is all. Were the imperialists expecting that after their first hostile act, our people would surrender? That the revolution would raise a white flag? Determined to show his resolve, the f Why is it he's determined to show his resolve? Everything that he just said is true. You, you yourselves provided the fucking evidence that everything that he just said is true. But he's just showing his resolve? Like, how do you say that and then not say, yeah, he had a point? How do you say that and still try to paint him as some fucking evil moron? What the hell, man? This level of mental gymnastics going on here to somehow paint the Cubans as the ones who were in the wrong is unreal. Fiery Castro passionately urged Khrushchev to issue a declaration stating that any attack on Cuban soil would be seen as an attack on the USSR itself, and to have his forces deployed throughout Europe to enter a state of maximum readiness. Khrushchev had absolutely no intention of doing either of these things. Kennedy, too, had played his hand carefully, having announced that the planned blockade would occur well outside of Cuba's territorial waters, and Castro realized that he had been neatly taken out of the diplomatic equation, leaving him with next to no say in any talks between America and the USSR. But there was still the matter of US reconnaissance flights taking place over Cuban airspace on a daily basis, fully convincing Castro that American action was imminent. On October 26th, Castro sent another letter to Khrushchev, stating his conviction that an attack would take place within the next 72 hours, and that he expected the USSR to respond with the full force of their nuclear arsenal. He then ordered his army to engage any US planes that violated his airspace. This was a fateful decision, as within 24 hours, a U-2 spy plane had been successfully shot down using Soviet-supplied surface tape. So, so Castro is the bad guy because he said he said that he expects full support from the USSR in the event of US retaliation to Cuba defending its own its own airspace from US military planes. Do you see the, how the framing here, right? Cuba de defending its own airspace from the invasions of a belligerent foreign power, infinitely more powerful than it is, is somehow framed as a bad thing, and, and, and Castro is a crazy guy. Work. Like, how on earth is this being framed as, as at all, as Cuba is, at, are, are all the bad guys here? Like, it's basically like lying by omission, right? By framing this as, like, only talking about what the Cubans are doing, and very rarely even mentioning the US, 
he's kind of like framing it in a way that everything that's happening is, is very ominous. Right, from the Cuban perspective, he means like, from an American perspective, where every single thing that the Cubans did was bad and evil. Air missiles. The incident shocked the world, instantly escalating tensions to a whole new level. Kennedy's ears filled with calls from his staff to retaliate, and safeguards around American missiles were relaxed to ensure they could be fired with minimal approval. Surely, Castro thought, this would be enough to push Khrushchev into action. Like, he's trying to make it out like Castro was trying to intentionally start a nuclear war just, just because he shot down American military planes violating Cuban airspace. If you defend yourself from the USA, you're, you're, you're a crazy guy who's trying to start a nuclear war. Just look at the fucking graphics here. Look at this shit. What a, what a fucking joke, man. You see, like, you have the rational American- look at- just look at the, the disconnect between these images. You have the rational American generals, advi you know, just advising the president all rationally, and then there's just Fidel Castro in front of a fucking- a nuke. You know, clearly one of these sides is- is smart and rational, and the other side is just a crazed nuclear maniac. And yet, ironically, Castro's determination to escalate the conflict ultimately proved to be one of the biggest factors that led to its peaceful resolution. In the words of Khrushchev's own son, Sergei, it was at that very moment, not before or after, that father felt the situation was slipping out of his control. Kennedy made a similar realization, concluding that the Cuban army had been acting outside of Soviet jurisdiction. The truth was that neither side wanted nuclear war under- So, cu the Cuban army was acting out of Soviet jurisdiction by- Of course, they're an independent nation, they're defending their own territory, it's not like they're gonna fucking invade the US. So Cuban soldiers are not allowed to be deployed in Cuba, and doing so is an act of aggression too? Defending your own airspace from US military planes? The same US that had just invaded you? That's an act of aggression? Like, this framing is any unreal. circumstances, and Castro's belligerent attitude brought home just how dangerous it was to have loose cannon rolling around the deck of the ship of state while negotiations were- How is Castro the loose cannon here? Castro is, is, is the leader of a country of 6 million people. 90 miles away from Florida that had just been invaded by the fucking USA with no power to to unleash these missiles at all no power to do anything but defend his own country and he, he's he's a loose cannon trying to cause doomsday unbelievable the way that this is this is the Cuban perspective the Cuban apparently apparently the Cuban perspective of the Cuban missile crisis is that everything that the Cubans were doing was bad and wrong and they were insane and trying to cause Armageddon amazing Amazing the way that they rationalize this shit. Amazing that he- that these fucking people can unironically title this from the Cuban perspective and, and frame it in this way. ...taking place. Both Khrushchev and Kennedy made a firm resolution to ignore any further warmongering advice from their subordinates, and began taking steps to defuse the situation as quickly as possible. While these events played out at the highest levels of government, ordinary Cubans, including those who had fled the country, awaited the outcome with bated breath. A Cuban exile living in Miami, Marta Darby, recalls the tension in an interview on National Public Radio, where she stated, I think at the time we were afraid that maybe something would happen to us much like the Japanese internment camps during World War II. And there were whispers of that. Oh, bullshit. Bullshit. The, the Cuban exiles in the US were, were practically US assets from the first fucking day, especially during this period. Later on, like, 80s, 90s, no. They, they were more just economic migrants, but like, these people, the ones who were already in the US at this point, they were absurd reactionaries who were loyal to everything the US wanted to do to Cuba. So this is just bullshit. Maybe they'll take us away and hide us somewhere. And that was a little bit scary. When asked about her experiences as a child still living in Cuba during the same interview, Maria Salgado recalled, I also remember family members from out of town coming in and everyone being in our same hometown because the world was going to end. So you wanted to be near your family, near your loved ones. As October 28th dawned, an increasingly nervous and expectant Castro received a phone call from Khrushchev, informing him that a deal had been signed that would see the removal of missiles from Cuba in exchange for a guarantee that no invasion of the island would take place. With trembling hands, Castro lowered the- Why? Why is he leaving this detail to a little graphic? Why is this in a little graphic? That's a huge detail, right? The actual point of the agreement for the USSR was was um, was to get the US to move US missiles away from Turkey. The US had missiles in Turkey that could be used to strike basically all of the USSR, all of its important targets. They had nuclear missiles in Turkey. So that was Khrushchev's concern here. So essentially, he's leaving the fact out here that Cuba was was basically played by both sides without getting anything out of the out of this entire affair except like like a, a guarantee from from the US government that um that, that they wouldn't invade which was kind of already implicit because Cuba being al aligned openly with the USSR made a made a US invasion 
much less likely with, with or without missiles. It, like, he's trying to frame it like Cuba were the, were the insane bad guys who were trying to cause a nuclear war, when in reality, Cuba was kind of um, just like in the middle of this. Receiver. How dare Khrushchev do this to him? Cuba had risked everything for this moment. Castro had personally offered his life and the live- He's trying to frame it here like, like the, the Cubans were angry because a nuclear war wasn't started. And fa thanks to Khrushchev and, um, and Kennedy and their rational negotiations, only thanks to them, the, the crazy Cubans were stopped from their desire for nuclear war. It's not that they were pissed off that there wasn't a nuclear war, it's that they didn't get shit out of it, it's that they were played. ...of his countrymen as a sacrifice on the altar of communism, and had been ready to die- Oh, just on the altar of communism, like, come on, Castro at this point barely knew anything about communism. He just declared himself a communist because he wanted to- he wanted to ally more of the USSR. If anything, it was like a sort of vague socialist, like, they're trying to paint him as some sort of ideological crazy guy. There's no rationality here, there's, there's no real politic, there's no, there's no international, you know, ge geopolitical interests at play here. It's just insane, insane adherence to crazy communist ideology. ...with a smile on his face if it meant striking a death blow to the hated imperialists. But instead, Castro's Praise supposed allies Allah. had acted without Praise even consulting him, disregarding his pride and Cuban sovereignty in favor of extracting a few concessions over missile sites in Turkey. In a fit of impotent fury, Castro trashed his office, kicking the walls and smashing yes. glassware while screaming obscenities at Cruz. Yeah, I'm sure that happened and was not just made up. Job, ending with an emphatic insult, I will politely decline from translating. Yes, I'm sure that happened and he's not just like... Quoting something that was made up 40 years later in, in a book or something. But you know, you, you'll never know because they don't actually specifically cite anything. They, you know, they just like toss a bunch of, um, a bunch of like sources here without actually telling you which specific one they're citing at any time. So you'd have to go through fucking all of them to find any of these supposed quotes or whatever the real source that these, that these claims are from. After he had finally calmed down, the embittered prime minister issued a public statement that he would accept the deal. But the U.S. also had to cease all attempts to interfere with Cuban sovereignty and swear never to violate their airspace or territorial waters again. As part of the deal, the Americans had secured rights to send inspectors to Cuba to monitor the removal of the Soviet missile sites. But Castro made it clear that any U.S. personnel who so much as set foot on his soil would be shot dead and their bodies tossed back into the ocean. Good. Dis oh, so he's crazy? He's crazy because he doesn't want the, the people who just invaded his country a year earlier? To act like they're some sort of neutral mediators? Like, come on, the framing of this is absurd. This guy is a piece of shit. Unreal. Despite mounting- Not only is he a piece of shit, but he's a dumb piece of shit. This entire video, like, it's, it's all, it's all visual, zero substance. What does he even do? He just pays animators to make, to make these- to make these animations, I doubt he, he draws any of it himself. He just writes the terrible scripts. Pressure from both sides, the revolutionary leader held firm, his wounded pride demanding appeasement. Meanwhile, disaffected Cubans chanted in the streets, Khrushchev, you coward, what is given as a gift is not taken away again. State media went into- That is not coward. I'm not gonna say what it is, but it's not coward. Overdrive, pumping out article after article decrying this deliberate betrayal of Cuban loyalty. Faced with the unyielding resolve from both leader and citizenry, even the mighty USSR had to give in eventually. After weeks of defiance, Castro won a morale victory, with the Soviets agreeing to ship the missiles out into international waters to be inspected there instead of on Cuban soil. As suddenly as they began, the newspaper articles and- He won a morale victory? Doesn't he mean moral victory? I don't know. Radio broadcasts condemning the Soviet withdrawal came to an end, and the sullen populace of Cuba resumed their normal lives. With nothing left to do, Castro descended into a state of depression. His bad mood was exacerbated when many communist parties in Latin America began praising Khrushchev for how well he had handled the situation. This is like, what are they doing? They're like, making a fucking- a composite character out of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro here or something, because this was- Castro was the one who wanted to- wanted to get close to the USSR, it was Che who didn't. So like, what is going on here? Where did they get this from? Che Guevara also reacted to the crisis with disgust, later stating that he would have personally fired the missiles himself if it meant destroying the USA forever. That, that, that one is specifically a false quote that was invented by exiles in Miami 40 years later. In the years that followed the missile crisis, relations between Cuba and the USSR slowly returned to normal. But a sense of betrayal still hung over the island nation. The radical communists of Cuba had been willing- Like they're trying to paint it like- the Cubans were radical communists. No, the Cubans were far less communist than the USSR were at this point, ideologically. Cuba had literally just had literally just been declared to be a communist state. Most people didn't really know much about communism. 
Fidel certainly didn't know that much about it compared to like Che. Most people in the government were still sort of like vague nationalist socialists more so than um, out and out ideological communists. Like they're just, this, this is a complete opposite of reality. ...to die for their ideals and felt that the Russians had snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Regular citizens were kept somewhat ignorant of the true nature of the crisis. As for the many Cuban exiles who had watched the whole affair on international news, they were relieved that the situation had been de-escalated, but saddened by... They watched the affair on US news, actually. ...the fact that their homeland still remained in communist hands. The descendants of these exiles continue to call for the democratization of Cuba to this day. For the democratization. Trust me, that's not what they want. They would be perfectly fucking happy if it had like some right-wing fascist dictator as long as he gave them their farms back. And though the government has made a few concessions over the years, the status quo remains more or less intact. Fidel Castro died on the 25th of November 2016 at the age of 90. He remains extremely popular among Cuban socialists, who view him as their liberator and as someone who always shared their burdens and endured hardship alongside the common man. Like the first five, six minutes, like the historical background before the revolution was okay, and then it just goes completely like, like, like they somehow created a video where, um, they somehow created a video where they go over the background and, and they make like the cause of the Cubans, of the Cuban revolutionaries seem very righteous and very justified. But then after that, suddenly, suddenly they, they, they become very evil and detestable and everything they do has like, has like fucking an ominous nature to it. And they're insane ideologues without any sort of rational, like any capacity for rational thought, just nothing but, but trying to spread international communist ideology. How do they reconcile those things, right? It's just, it's just the, the cognitive dissonance, dissonance needed to make a video like that is off the charts. From a Cuban perspective for five minutes as a treat, and then after that, nothing but, um, nothing but from the US perspective, nothing but like, um, the most ridiculous, exaggerated Stalin, Beria, unfair depiction, Gula. Stalin, Beria, Gulag.